Welcome everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Marley Grace, whose book we are particularly celebrating, um, Getting to Center. Yes, right there. Um, and Sarah Faith Gottesdiener, uh, who, uh, whose book we are also celebrating um, because we're pretty jazzed about that as well. It is called The Moon Book, Lunar Magic to Change Your Life. So um, really, this is going to be a really fun conversation because y'all are friends and uh, in some ways co-conspirators across lots of things. Um, we first met Marley at the Decatur Book Festival last year, even though it feels like a hundred years ago. Um, and cause you were, um, you were debuting how to not always be working. Um, and which has been super relevant to all of us working from home. So thank you for that. Like, like I go back to it again and again. Um, yeah, it's super, I think lots of people have discovered that book in this time of having no separation of, of uh, digital church and state. So um, thank you for that. And um, it's been, it's been, you know, just a few months and then now we have this gift. So um, I'm gonna introduce them with their bios <clears throat> and then let y'all know a little bit about how to interface on here and then I'm gonna pop out of the way. So Marley is a dancer and a writer. Marley's personal work focuses on improvisation through movement and art making, as well as bringing together the voices of artists through her podcast and artist residency program. As an author and workshop facilitator of How to Not Always Be Working, which she has taught to groups across the country, she delights in the process of showing up to her own practice of being human and finds great joy in navigating with others. She is currently based near Santa Fe, New Mexico. So welcome from Santa Fe. Um, and Sarah Faith is an artist, author, and business owner working in Los Angeles, California. She wrote the cult classic lunar workbooks, Many Moons, from 2015 to 2018, and her book, The Moon Book, Lunar Magic to Change Your Life, published like this, like last week, basically. Um, and no, what? Soon. Soon. I keep getting the day. Okay. We're right in here. Uh, time is a flat circle and false construct. Uh, she is a psychic, a tarot reader, and a dog lover. You may get to hear or see her plug in a minute. Um, you can find her at modernwomanprojects.com. <gasps> there is it. Tell, tell us your pug's name. This is Sasha. Sasha. Um, I'm super jazzed about Sasha. Um, so before I get out of here, I want to let folks who are watching at home know that you are welcome to as folks are already doing, introduce yourself in the chat, say where you are watching from. Um, you can also begin to ask questions at any time in this little ask a question box in the bottom center of the screen. I know we want to uh, to have some questions, so you can also, of course, interface with Sasha at any time. Um, and uh, the this link to um, will take you to the page to buy Getting to Center, um, but I will tell you it is currently um, in stock at our bookstore, but out of stock on our website, which is a little frustrating. We apologize. All you got to do is give us a call or shoot us an email. We'll make sure that you get your copy right away. So we have it in the store, ready to go, ready to put in your hands. Um, we do ship all over the United States. And um, so at the end of the session, I'll pop back up and make sure that you have that info that you need to make sure that you get both of these books. Um, so welcome. I'm really glad that you're both here. Really excited for this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. From Detroit to Portugal, the people are here. I love, I love it. Oh, I wonder what time it is in Portugal right now. Is it like 3 a.m.? Yeah, I'll tell us. 3 a.m. Well, I must be in Porto. Marley, hi. Hi, Ellen. How's it going? How are you? Know. Hmm. We had a bit of a chaotic day here in our home. We, um, I forgot to get the propane tank filled, so we were lacking in some hot water. And uh, then the pilot, we had to ask extra help, but we got it all figured out. So I felt, so my hair is washed for the first time in a very many, many days, and it felt like great timing to just get all showered for the people today. Yeah, um, 
So I know that when we kind of touched base about gathering tonight, there was a few things that you wanted to speak about, and there was a few things that I wanted to speak about. Hello from Baltimore, from Atlanta, Atlanta, Detroit, New Orleans. Uh, what I wouldn't give to be in New Orleans right now. Um, yes, Lisa, it is being recorded. So don't you worry, you have the link. You'll probably even get it as soon as this is over. So don't worry, this is all digitized, capsulated for everybody and their mother. Okay, so we had wanted to talk about a couple of different things. And I think the first thing I wanted to talk about was something I hadn't gone over with you, but it's not like a weird surprise question. But I don't think I ever asked you this question ever. I think you just told me that you got a book deal. Mm -hmm. And I think you told me the concept or the title. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever asked you when you were writing the book and when you were conceptualizing the book, what your intention was. Mm -hmm. First of all, you can always ask me surprise questions. You know, I welcome them, yeah, like a, you know. Yeah, I, I, what were my intentions in writing the book? You know, I feel like I, I have had like in my career, it sort of, you know, I used, I started my career on my own writing and then it shifted into owning a store and a gallery and a residency, which is where we met. It's all, I realize it's almost our five year anniversary in January. Oh, five year anniversary. A, ha a whole half decade. Um, and then, you know, transitioned into book writing and online teaching. And I feel like what I just, it sort of feels like my, like calling from spirit or God or whatever anyone calls it, that it's like, when I tell my story, other people feel less alone, and I feel less alone in that reflection. And so, you know, I think that, um, especially like, being married in like a hetero presenting marriage, and then coming out as being gay and <clears throat> getting sober at a young age, you know, I kind of like have these little markers that I was like, really noticing that people wanted more of the story. They were kind of like, well, what really happened? And like, how did you get sober? And like, what was it like to go through a divorce and move across the country? And so um, I think my intention in all of my work and in the book is really like, I want to be of service and making people feel less alone. I think that, and it's funny because when I got the book deal and started the book and started doing everything last year, I certainly did not know it would come out in um, a global pandemic and in the wild year of 2020. And so, yeah, which kind of has felt like really beautiful, like just really on time, because I think people feel more alone than they ever have, both like they are physically more alone. And I think in that isolation, it's really easy to like spiral out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's my, been my was my intention, and it seems like it's working. And you know, I also I want to just spit tennis ball right back to you and ask what your intention was. I think especially, you know, I love that ER called it the cult classics because I really feel as though your workbooks are cult classics, but um you know, why, why go from the sort of every six month journal, um, or, you know, journal, do you call it? Journal, right, workbook? Uh, yeah. Um, and then the planner was born, like, what, what was that? Like, why, why make the evergreen book? Like, what do you feel like your intention is with that? And, and it coming out, you know, during this time also? Great question. Thanks. Thanks, friend. Thanks, five-year-old friend. <laughs> um, almost. Uh, so while I was writing the workbooks, I what many times I thought, well, this content is evergreen, even though the premise was that they were channeled workbooks um, to work in real time with 
phases uh, in conjunction with the moon. The information that was coming through was universal. It wasn't tied. And in fact, many people have told me, I just go back to my workbook or I'll, I'll just find something, you know, uh, I, if I want to do something or if I need some support. Mm-hmm. So I always wanted to do um, a series of books and I had actually concepted it as like greatest hits, like greatest hits, new moon, greatest hits, waxing moon, greatest hits, dark moon. Like I wanted in my mind, they all sit like five on a shelf and you're like, I want to learn about the dark moon. Um, and I, you know, that's, this is the greatest hits. This is like the overview. Um, so I had always wanted to do that. And I just thought that one day I would just self publish, but I kept having publishers. Oh, and then I'll say one more thing. Sorry. Yeah. So also behind the scenes, I have my client work and I have my teaching practice that I created that is unique and I've taught many people it and it's very, it's different than the workbooks. Like they're not like the workbooks aren't like, do this, do that, do that. That's not what they're supposed to be. And the class and the way that I teach is a little bit more prescriptive. So basically, uh, when the opportunity arose for me to write, uh, for me to write a book, I wanted to combine aspects of the workbooks, ideas that had come forth with this unique way of working with lunar energy to transform and heal from the inside out. So that's what the book tries to do. Um, that was my intent with it. Um, I mean, I always said I wrote the books. I never want to write another fucking book about the moon ever again. I just want to like all in one place. So, but that's not true because I'm already like, oh, I didn't put this thing in or, ah, you know, so who knows what will happen. But um, yeah, that was my, that was my intention. I mean, my intention is much greater. My intention is to change the way we live. Mm. Actually, like, is to change, uh, is to create, is to open folks' mind to different paradigms that have already been existing in the multiverse for thousands of years, maybe billions of years. Um, that's really what the intention is. It's not like to learn some factoids about the moon. It's like which they're in there. But I really um, like working in this way changed my life and it changes people's lives I work more closely with. So I really wanted to offer it up to the collective in a way that hopefully will support and change their lives. And also last, and then I'll be quiet and ask you another question. You know, like, I think that a lot of my creative work or my psychic work or my channeled work is, healing different aspects of myself. So with the lunar work, a lot of it is healing um, my younger self. So writing the book, I wish the 15 year old like bisexual me in the suburbs would encounter like wishing. So I, I, a lot of my work up till now has been sort of like honoring the, the inner child or the teenage self. And of course, in doing so, hoping that there are some like younger people that could benefit from this. Um, and then in turn, like I am healed or that aspect of myself is healed because we know that obviously healing is also nonlinear and it can, it can ripple out. Um, so those are all kind of the components of where I'm at with my with my book, my intention. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I feel that in in getting to center, I talk about this poem that I found, and I, I just found it last year, right around this time, actually, that I wrote when I was 16. And the poem is like, I'm like, I was acute, there were accusations that I was the ballet lesbian. And in the poem, I'm like, I'm not a dyke. Like, and then I was like, I had kind of just blacked that out. Like I was like, oh, somebody made a joke that I was a lesbian because I said who I had a crush on. And then I literally opened the closet door and put myself in there and came out when I was 28, you know? And it's like, I, yeah, feel the same. Like telling that story 
I feel teary eyed. Like I, I like, I feel so sad. I don't even, I still don't actually really remember 16 year old me feeling that like I can, it's really hard to access that, but having the poem was a pretty easy proof of what was, what was going on. Um, and yeah, definitely like loving that version of myself that was, was really afraid. Um, so yeah, I love that. Um, was that like one of your big brushes with queerness when you were young? Yeah, I think I, I can't remember if I, I think I talk about this in the book. There's like a, it was really like, it's, it's so interesting looking at the facts. Like I think I was 10 when I like dry humped and made out with the neighbor girl. Like I think I was, I was like 15 when I made out with my best friend as a dare. I think I suggested the dare on the bus, if I remember correctly. Like yes. And then apparently I had a crush on this other ballerina and was made fun of and was like, all right, never mind. And then what, what was really interesting for me was like, I continued to identify as queer. Like when we met, I identified as queer. I was, I was like in an open relationship. I've, I've always like hooked up with lots of different people. But I, there was something about, I think because I was made fun of for being a lesbian, I was like, I will, I can be queer, but I will not be a lesbian because that is what gets made fun of. Like that was my, that was what I was told. Like, and in my adult life, I was like, well, I'm queer, but I was like so scared to like, I could have sex with women and fall in love with them, but they were not happening together because that would be lesbianism. And I was like, no, 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 not over here. And then shout out to my first girlfriend, Emily, who was willing to hold my little hand and be like, you can, you can do this. Um, and yeah, I mean, my sexuality still feels like really abundant and fluid, but um it is different. It's definitely different than than it was than it was before. Or it's the exact same as when I was ten to sixteen. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I'm just thinking about how words, like you know, like I, I have like the opposite experience in a way because I never had. I was very lucky to not have a lot of. abuse or anything like put on me when I like I came out when I was I think I was 15 or 16 and started dating girls in high school and then I dated guys like hence the bisexual I don't identify as bisexual I'm like my husband does but I don't like he's like we need to bring bisexuals in yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I will he will take that for the team I he love that also murder me if he hears me saying this on like a public live stream but anyway I then I identified as bisexual and then I had a moment in my life around 22 um where I really stepped into like dyke dumb and I was like everyone that I hang out with are dykes work lesbians were dykes were queer or you know it was very um of that flavor at that particular time um and then when i and i and i and i was a dyke and then i met my partner who's a trans dude and so then i had to go into the queer closet or like i had to like you know what i mean like i've been like bisexual questioning lesbian queer and it's like it's just funny it's like i was like oh i can't i'm like I can't be a lesbian anymore. Goodbye. Like I have to say goodbye to that. But he, we joke, like he always calls me, he's like, my wife's a lesbian, you know, <laughs> so he'll call me that. But it's funny how for you, mm. I'm getting at is for you, lesbian felt dangerous. Yeah. Now it feels like the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because it's like, I talked about this in one of the last, um, book events I did. And this is something I feel like we both talk a lot about in like our business and our and how we speak publicly is like, 
you know, lesbian separately just also, I think, gets a really bad rap when there are like TERFs happening. And for those who don't know that word, that would be like a trans exclusionary radical feminist who doesn't believe trans women are women. And, or like uses language like women born women only. Um, and so I think that's always been like, a that was sort of like a tricky part for me, like using that word, um, which is why I, in some spaces I, more use the word dyke or you, I do, or I use the word gay or I use the word queer because I sometimes still get prickly at the word lesbian where I'm like, Ooh, like, Ooh, like, am I, you know, cause I don't know, maybe I would, I don't know. There's a part of my sexuality that is like abundant in that way where I'm like, I don't know, maybe I would date a non-binary person who doesn't, wouldn't like if, you know, but I've seen that too, where like, there's a lot of people who identify as non-binary lesbians. There's like your husband who's like, my wife's a lesbian. Like, I just think that that's where I love that worse in the year 2020, we're seeing people use it in a really, in a way that isn't exclusionary of anyone. Well, I'm really interested in words that feel comfortable that aren't based on who we're sleeping with. Like, why is that? Why does, why is that the determinant of like all that we are and all that, you know, like, why can I, I can't be a dyke now, but like in five years, I mean, I'm never, we're never going to break up, but like if that happened or whatever, yeah. you know, then I could just go back. To, it's just very, it feels very, um, I feel like we're like post postmodern. And so it, that feels like post, I don't know. I'm like, I'm like edging from post to post post. But anyway, I just think that's interesting. And I think that um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, which sort of you kind of brought up um, was like sharing the stories of your life. How did writing this book change you? Mm. I think I got to know myself deeper, like even that example of <clears throat> sharing my experience, like reading the poem, it like made me, I could have just been like, ha ha ha, found this poem. And instead I like wrote about, like writing about it. I mean, it's so similar. It, it's exactly what you said about your own work, about like this non-linear healing of like, when I write, I'm healing myself. And so, um, yeah, I, we both make this joke to each other a lot that like we should read our own books because we really give great advice to other people. And so, you know, in in some ways, and I also, I think we, I know we share um, like the idea of how much our writing is channeling. So sometimes I read or have someone else read my writing back to me and I'm like, wow, who wrote that? That's so, I really should do that. And then I'm like, I'm, I did with my hands, I wrote it, but, um, and I think, you know, it made me, um, it's the longest thing I've ever written, you know, it's five times longer than how to not always be working. And I think it helped me. Um, it was just kind of like an esteemable act to, to take on such a big project and finish it. Um, that felt like really good to me. Um, and then I think the last thing was, you know, similarly to like wanting to help change people. And it's so sweet that we're the ones doing this because I will just take this time to publicly say like Sarah is someone who, I like cry on every public event I do, even though I'm not sad. I think that's like a pandemic thing is like tears just come out of my face. Anyways, um, you know, Sarah is someone who I have just, both in our friendship and as peers, like learned so much about how as a white person and as a white cis person, how I want to run a business and exist as an artist and exist as someone who makes money. And so a lot of the book is about like how to not center yourself. Like the book is like, find your center so that you can decenter, so that you can like, um, not be the center, but, you know, be a part of and be generous and redistribute your money and, you know, have a fundraiser, ha you know, give part of, a, a, I saw you write about this today on, 
our favorite thing, social media. Um, but you know, talk about like, I give a percentage of my income or I have products where all of the income goes there. And so, you know, I think it just, that's how it affected me was like writing it and making it public as being like, you can also do these things. Um, it just sort of rooted me like this year I have collectively redistributed, donated and raffled and pooled tens of thousands of dollars. I have never done that before. Like, and um, that has felt, you know, that's not a pat on the back. That's just like, I did what I think is my responsibility, which you and so many friends have taught me. And so I, re I really hope that other people, and I started that practice when I was broke. Like I did not start that practice when I had book deals. Like I was like, here's $5 to your GoFundMe. Like, good luck, you know, and that stuff adds up. And it's just the practice of doing it keeps me not thinking about myself as much. So even though the book's a lot about myself, um, I think I it just really, yeah, helped me like take that, take those actions more seriously. Um, yeah, I think it's really important uh, as a white person to just be like, hey, here's what I do. Here's how I do it. Here's how this works. This is what we're doing. And it's really not. I mean, like my theory is that if if like a, a moderately small percentage, if 30 percent of white people who make comfortable living, who can like you know, buy laptops every two years or whatever. I don't know how, what we're gonna use as a bar or a metric, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. They didn't stop going out to brunch. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, but if, if like if like 30 percent of those white people gave 10 to 20 percent of their income into redistribution, uh, I do think we would collectively see a change in many other ways, because as you know, Marley, and I know this is not like what we planned on talking about, so forgive me if I'm off off roading a little, but it changes your relationship with resources and money in really interesting ways. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit how it changed for you. Yeah, you know, and I also just like to be transparent, and this is not another like, let me, set myself up as as uh, I, I don't come from generational wealth I don't come from I don't have a trust fund I don't have any I have zero people in my family in my immediate family I could ask for help so you know that's I was born into scarcity mindset I was born into scarcity mindset and debting and a lot of bad money behavior and so which I also talk about in the book, um, that I've been like deeply trying to re <laughs> relearn another thing that Sarah has helped me with a lot. And, um, you know, it feels like weird. I mean, this is again, probably where I have so much unlearning to do, like feels weird to say, but like, yes, the more generous I am with my money, the more money I make. Like I have definitely found that when I, and it also just like is an encourager to me. I think as I see my own money get lower, I'm like, mm, better think of another online class or like think of another thing. Cause I do have that privilege to like keep generating new ideas and that, and I love to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like, you know, that's been part of the practice for me is the more generous I am. Also for me, I started organizing um, last year, the last time I taught my quilting class online, I made a quilt during that time and I raffled the quilt off. And that felt like a really good, you know, cause, cause a lot of times I'll just, do, I'll just like donate a percent of my online class. But I was like, you know, I actually need money right now and I would like to make X amount teaching, but I have time, especially cause my partner was gone a lot for work. And so I made a giant quilt and fundraised forty four hundred dollars you know and so so and i want to interrupt you forgive me but like i also i just want to like underline it's not always about money it's like what you can give away in terms of your expertise exactly. your, time, your mentorship 
teaching, if you have a farm, if you have herbs, like whatever it is, it's not always just like, because that's really capitalist to be like, oh, money is the only thing or, you know, it's, there's so many other things. And, and the spirituality and collectivism, like all, like you, that's just what I hear you describing, correct? Yeah. Yes, and I think I was feeling a little stuck. Like I was like, I don't have as much money right now that I would want to give. And I, you know, I do still get in places where I'm like a little tight. So it felt really good to do that. And right now I'm organizing a group quilt. So I have 60 people who are mailing me quilt squares and they're so beautiful. And I'm gonna put them together and raffle those off so we can flip the freaking Georgia Senate to blue. Um, and then we're gonna do another one that's gonna go to smaller mutual aid funds. So I've also been trying to like, yeah. you know, balance that like, you know, bigger organizations, mutual aid funds, individuals, you know, I think that's another important part. But yeah, I mean, the other thing is like, I actually stopped promoting doing one-on-one -on -one client work, like doing creative advising, because I was noticing it was really burning me out and I couldn't find a price ta tag for those sessions that felt like correct for me and somewhat accessible. And so I stopped doing them and now I just, they're like another form of generosity or currency to trade. Like right. I'll just offer it to a friend with no, I'll just be like, I don't need anything. Like I want to support you launching your online class um, or yeah. Sometimes it is really beautiful as just like another thing I have that isn't money. Um, yep. So yeah. That, yeah. I mean, we could, obviously we could talk about this all day, but I wanted to bring up a topic you suggested speaking about, and that is expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard someone say, in the 12 step rooms, expectations are resentments waiting to happen. And uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, I mean, people have been saying that in those rooms for decades. I don't know who's, who invented it, but um, yeah, I have felt a little, um, this, this process of putting my book out, I think I thought my expectations were what I like to call right sized. Um, and I've had some, I've had some things be not what I thought they would be. And that is, um, I don't, I don't have like a great, like icing on the cake for that. Like I don't have a lesson quite yet. Like I am just kind of in the process still of being like, yeah, like where did I, not where did I go wrong? I don't like to say where I went wrong, but where I just had expectations that I didn't need to have. Um, and a lot of times the expectations can kind of block me from all the really beautiful things that are happening. Like, I love you, I love this event, I've loved, every event I've done has been so amazing and I feel so supported. I've gotten so many messages and emails and people posting about it on social media that means so much to me. And I thought a couple other things might happen. You know, I wasn't, I didn't think I was gonna New York Times bestseller the damn thing, but I thought, you know, it would appear maybe somewhere else, you know, considering the amount of like people I had in my corner. And so, and that's not like a blast on them either per se, like it's just, it's really hard, I think, to put art out right now. Um, I think it's always really hard, but I think, um, yeah, it's hard. So I've been really, you know, gratitude lists are so important to me to just kind of get back on track, but it's also like, I can use gratitude as a distraction from feeling sad. And I've had to feel sad a few times to be like, okay, this one thing I thought was gonna go one way and it didn't. Um, and that feels important too, because if you just look at my social media, I look I look like I'm having a great time over here. And I am in a lot of ways. I have a really beautiful life that I'm I am really grateful for. And that is a projection to eighty thousand something people that I make up every day. Um, you know, behind the scenes, it's it has been. It's hard. It's and it's just so much work. I've been thinking lately, like yeah. I think when we have like weird made up, made up jobs, like teaching online and having a newsletter, I have a Patreon, I have, 
my radio show, which isn't really my work, but you know, I'm a dancer. I write books. Like I'm, I wrote a book called how to not always be working, which I should really revisit at this point. Um, cause, and I love, I love working. It's fun. I have a fun, I have a really fun job and I'm tired today. Like I'm tired. I've been holding a lot of space for people in the zoom rooms lately. And yeah. again, there's a financial exchange. I feel seen, I feel supported and like, I'm just doing a lot right now. And, um, yeah, I get sad. I get sad sometimes when I, I'm having a little bit of like the only person I can trust is me, which is true. Really? I mean, <laughs> expectations are reasonable. Mm. Like it's reasonable when you enter into an agreement with a person, with a contract, If you expect that when you put your garbage out on the curb, you expect that a garbage person is going to come and take that, and that garbage person's name is Sarah Faith Goddess Sooner. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, I'm meant to be gender neutral. So a garbage person, I like that. If, if that trash isn't taken out, you're like, you're maybe not crying, but you're like, oh, I had this expectation. So I think in certain cases, I think expectations are really reasonable. Mm. I think unfortunately, or the real talk is that during a pandemic, there should be no expectations of anyone, including, um, maybe even including ourselves, yeah. uh, depending on the day, right? But the other thing I want to say that I think is really important about expectations is on some levels, they show us what our needs are. And they show us what our deeper yearnings are. And they show us what our dreams are. And like, for example, if, an, if my expectation is that I want to be supported, that's, my, that's a dream or that's a desire or that's a really deep need that I have. So I think that if it is an alignment, if it makes sense, like examining what those expectations are to help someone process, come into contact with what they feel like they need or what they desire, I think is actually really useful. And I think you're right. I think expectations are, I mean, I call, I coined the term like toxic expectations like anything that is like wildly, you know, like mm -hmm. out of my sphere of influence or out of reality. But I also think it's really important like to sit down and write about our expectations if they reflect, if they can give us more information about what we can work on giving ourselves or what we can mm, Try not to have so nebulous and so attached to external things or to people. Um, but if we can sort of wrap our hands around what those are and work with them in a way where we're able to receive ourselves on some level, you know, um, that's sort of my take on it. I think it's I think they're important. I don't think that they're always um you know they're definitely not a sure bet you know um and 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 i think that i think that you know in your heart and i know this is just one moment and i know this was just one sentence but i think you know in your heart you can trust a variety of different people in your life but i i feel you i feel you friend i feel you i trust you i trust you too i know um, okay. Well, I have a question for you, which kind of bounces. It's a little bit of a bounce from my book to your book. Um, in, in getting to center, um, I was like, is that what it's called? Getting to center. I don't even know anymore what it's called. Um, I talk about 
which actually also reminds me of expectations. I talk about sort of like the seasons we go through of creating. I talk about if you're someone with a menstrual cycle, you might go through different seasons within your 28 days. If you, um, you might go through different seasons of winter, what you can make in the winter and some pole traveler here who hates that 12 step phrase. Love it. Let's get rid of it. I believed it until Sarah just told me I could have reasonable expectations. Um, okay. Seasons of creating. I'm thinking about the expectations I put on myself to be really productive. Um, and as far as I know, we have entered into something called eclipse season, which we know people are scared of. And you do such a beautiful job being like, stop. You're always like, stop. Stop being scared of stuff that's in the sky. So maybe you could tell us a little bit, either working from something that's in the book that you love, um, or just maybe what you're, I'm thinking about it sort of in relation to like business and art practice. Um, and maybe that would be helpful to people right now going in. We're like having eclipse season in the true season of capitalism. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, I just would love to hear what what's coming up for you right now. What <laughs> what can we expect? Yeah, I mean, I think it it always only depends on like where you are and and what you're interested in. And I don't think that there's a blanket, uh, you know, definition or experience that will fit everyone because I don't believe that. I, I used the word uh, collective earlier, but I actually don't believe in that. What I mean is I don't believe like we're a monolith. Like mm. you know, I think like, I think that, that like I've been trying to unravel like ideas in new age world or in spiritual world of that term collective um, and how it might sort of cuddle up with white supremacy. Like mm -hmm. I think everyone having the same experience or being the same when like we're all very different and we come from different and mm -hmm. we're all in different places and I'm just sort of wanted to kind of call that out. But um it's so funny that I'm just trying to look in my book. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to here's one and I, I can't find the thing I'm looking for, but I'll just read it. Eclipse, page 255. Eclipses are always innocent. All celestial events are. It's we humans who feel so out of control so much of the time, who project, who project the good, the bad, the ugly, the fearful onto the cosmic stage. Funny how we see ourselves as superior to those in ancient times and their archaic customs, yet so many of us play out the same superstitions, albeit through crystal screens we hold in our hands. To be certain, eclipse energy can be intense and sometimes painful. It is often contrast that wakes us up, makes us look up, and helps us make needed course corrections in our lives. Anything can always be looked at as a curse or seen as an opportunity. So that's sort of one little outtake. But I think that it's really important to see what's coming up, uh, to see what's saying, like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think a lot of people are like, if, if, if you're thinking about it and, and what comes up for you is like, I don't want to do any of it anymore. You know, like, I think that's a lot of what people are like, I don't want to do any of this anymore. That can be a little bit overwhelming. So I think that's like, maybe that first just means you need to rest for a couple of days or get, you know, some sleep or just take a break hydrate, you know, take a bath, you know, if you can or a shower or whatever. Um, but then really think about like the overriding feeling or the overriding themes that are um, coming up for you. So like, for example, if you zoom out on your life, and you notice this pattern, like you can like be like, Oh, my gosh, I have this pattern of instead of sitting with my feelings, I, I'm really, I get really busy or, you know, whatever that is. Or if, or if you're like, if you catch yourself or your partner 
or a really close friend saying to you, uh, like, here we go again. Or you're like, I always do this. Or like, like those sorts of things where you're like, oh, I'm tired again. Or, uh, you know, like, like that person fucked me over. Or like, if you, if you're like, again, if it's Groundhog Day in one or more aspects of your life, eclipse season is this really gorgeous time for us to really see what's underneath it and to see what the symbolism of it is. And also to see like, like, like what is that symbolizing on a subconscious level, um, on a relational level, on a behavioral level, on a needs level, on an identity level. This year has been so much for so many people, for so many different reasons, a lot of questioning about identity and who am I and what am I here and what am I doing? And a lot of, um, a lot of questioning about what we attach to, to support certain aspects of our identity and why, and what happens when those fall away or what happens when we understand they're not helping anymore or they're a lie or they're a fucking lie. You know what I'm saying? So if you're, if you feel like this, it's okay. Like it's not, I'm not trying to scare anyone. You know, it, it like, it feels intense to put it lightly. It feels, I mean, for myself as a business owner in holiday season, like the last thing I want to be doing is promoting. Like the last thing I want to be doing is like, you know, like it's not, it's uh, after this year. I mean, and never do I like promoting never. I don't, I don't know one small business owner that's like, I love promoting and talking about my stuff. Like if anyone acts like they're good at marketing, like I'm like Homer Simpson into the bushes or I need to sign up for their class because I'm like, but I'm digressing. But my point is, and I do have one, <laughs> is notice what is coming up for you. Notice what patterns are coming up. You don't have to solve them. Mm. You give it over to God, you can give it over to spirit. You can say like, I'm surrendering, I'm noticing. And then when you feel a little bit more resource, you can make different decisions. You can tap in, you don't have to do it all at the same time. We're not meant to do it all at the same time. So start journaling, have conversations with trusted loved ones, cry in the bath, see like a lot of times our resentments, you were saying expectations, our resentments yeah. waiting to happen. You know, when are you feeling triggered, resentful? Who do you hate right now? Who's annoying you right now? Why? Why are you getting annoyed? Why are you tired? Do you have to analyze it? You know, but maybe you do want to track it so that when you have, when you can take a breath, you can sort of take little baby steps into uh, working through whatever you don't want to be attached to anymore. Because one thing, and this is the last thing I'm going to say um, of, on this subject, and then we can keep it moving. But we're we think we're attached, and that and that connection, that cord, that cord of scarcity or like overextension or overdependence on something we think we need whether it's to be okay or to be loved or to have a roof over our head, um, whatever it, whatever's coming up for you. A lot of it's usually around security, scarcity, identity, being seen, being acknowledged, being loved. These are basic human needs. We all have them. I have them so much, right? I know you do too, Marley. Um, just watch what you're attaching to if it's like, like question if it's real, like question if that attachment, like if I have the thing or if I, if I, if I, I have to act like that when you catch yourself in those, like, but I have to, that's where all the resistance is. And that's where, you know, you can detach lovingly. Am I making sense? That was beautiful. I'm how long does it last? The eclipse season last for approximately 20 more years. No, I'm just <laughs> it only feels like 20 years when you're like on the lifeboat in the ocean. No, it'll, you, everyone will feel clearer. I predict mm -hmm. it's different for everyone. Many will feel a shift uh, around the 20th. 
But then there's this other huge astrological happening that everyone is hubbubbing about called the Great Conjunction, which I also is not, I, which it's on the 21st. It's also something we don't have to fear. It's um, Jupiter and Saturn moving into Aquarius, which is cool. A lot of astrologers are saying it's the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Oh. They're, and they're conjuncting, they're joining up on a similar uh, uh, degree in the sky, which doesn't happen. It happens about every 20 years and it's been a couple hundred years, I think since it's been in this sign. Don't quote me on that, Google can be your friend. But um, so uh, people are saying there'll be a shift of earth uh, mm -hmm. because it was an earth it was in Capricorn into Aquarius into air. So maybe you'll feel it. Maybe you won't. But I do think that like by, by the end of this year, one or more like sticking points for you, for the, you know, if you're like, ah, I think there'll be some kind of levity, some grace. Mm -hmm. Well, I think grace comes in when we surrender. Yes. I mean, that's what I'm, what I heard or what I'm needing to hear is what like that i've been giving myself this question like what if there's nothing to fix today which is like what you said like what if there's nothing to solve today what if i can just observe and record the patterns in myself the patterns between me and my partner the patterns between me and friends that i talk to the patterns that my neighbor does i don't know like i think i uh permission to not solve like i really want to fix something every day. And that's that's my exhaustion right now, really, when I think about it. So I I needed to, the word surrender. But what do you mean when you say fix? Like, what exactly do you mean? Which part? Well, what is there to fix? I mean, I know the world is broken, but I mean, other than that, like, I, I don't really know what you mean. <laughs> like, um, things in myself or things in my dynamic with other people. I'm like, that has to be better. It has to be better, I guess is the word. I guess if I'm trying to fix something, I'm assuming something's broken. I don't know if that's, is that, I don't mean to get astrological because I know it doesn't matter. I won't, I won't even say it. I love that, I love you, I love that you love me. It's just like, I, I have an obsession with wanting to fix everything. Or just maybe, maybe I have an obsession that I think everything's wrong. Cause what, so like, this is like everyone listening is like the dark side of self development. It's like, yeah. there's, no like end to it. there's no end to the no. transition from public event to what me and Sarah text about every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going. Probably you read your own book, babe. No. So, well, I actually want to, I, I don't want to laugh this off. I want to, I honestly, I'm curious. I'm curious. Yeah. What do you think fixing would create inside of you? Right. And there, there's been a few things in my life lately where I'm like, if I, if this thing was just going this way, I'd be okay. Or if I just had this, I would be okay. Whether it's a dynamic with someone or a literal product. Um, yeah, I think, I think I will like finally achieve ultimate serenity. And stop being so cuckoo for cocoa puffs up here. So it's serenity. So you equate like like so I talk about this all the time. The the when if thinking, you know, yes. when I when all my for me right now, I'm like, when all my laundry is put away. <laughs> my laundry is like on my bed for like six days. I'm like, when my laundry is put away, I'll be a good functioning member of society. Um, no, the when and then if, uh, I think it's really important to look at because what I will say is the when if is only designed to keep you in scarcity and yeah. detached from yourself and abandoning yourself. You know what I mean? No, I mean I mean I'm not saying this you. I'm like the I'm like in the in the sky, not the, you know, not but so I just think it's like I love that question. I love that beginning practice of like what if I didn't have to fix anything today because that brings you back to yourself. Yes, your humanity. Yes. And 
it's a life hack because then it, it's at, like, so I always teach this and this is like very, this is very like 101, but like what you're desiring is the symbol of either a unneed met, uh, a subconscious story, um, or just the way you want to feel the majority of the time, or even just 50% of the time, right? If you could feel serenity 50% of the time, you'd be like a lotto winner. I mean, we all, right? So I would just say, you're not asking for advice from me, but I am curious about like you switching your vision into all of the activities and feelings and um, reflections that bring you into more clarity and serenity. Yes. I love that. I, someone in the chat said, when does self-improvement morph into self-punishment? And I really relate to that. It's a nightmare. It's like one of my friends, Rachel Ricketts calls the like wellness industry instead of the health and wellness, she calls it the wealth and hellness because they're all trying to sell you this bullshit when like, if we just stop buying so much, I mean, you know what I think if we all just went on strike yeah. and became socialist, not yeah. our problems wouldn't be solved. Huh. Don't get me started about like the arguments I got into with my partner about like people are people and other socialist countries, there's still tons of corruption and abuse of power. And I'm not, I'm just speaking utopic, but anyway. Um, yeah. So you got to watch out for that, that voice. And the other thing I want to say, Marley, or whoever else is listening out there. And cause I think about this a lot this year, especially is like, that's a programming. The part of you that is like, if I have, you know, a better interaction with, you know, whatever, then I'll be good or whole or whatever that is. That's not you. Yeah. That's, a, that's a programming. That's, and that luckily can be deprogrammed with time because it was programmed into you and it was reinforced by like every single billboard and every single class you were in and every single, I mean, it's public school, not in your wonderful workshops, but you know, so that's all it's, but it's programming. So you can deprogram yourself out of it, which I think to me is really exciting. Like, I'm like, oh, this actually isn't even me. I think it's me saying it, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, I can't wait to deprogram. That sounds great. Let's take some questions. Let's take some questions. So friends, um, uh, I'm gonna read some questions. I'm inviting anyone to write questions into that ask a question chat and then Marley and I will get through as many of them as possible. Um, okay, oh my gosh, these are so good. These are really I'm so glad you're going to answer them first because they're so big and good. Okay. You both write and speak a lot about self and community healing. Do you ever feel like you're healing in public? How is that for both of you? Yeah. I mean, I do in some ways, yes, but I think that's where like the projection feels really interesting to me. Like I'm definitely, I mean, I go to, I'm a part of two 12 step programs and see a therapist every week and get a lot of outside help. Like I'm not sharing the, the deepest wounds I'm working on publicly. I'm usually sharing things once the wound is like a little more stitched up. So, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people are like, wow, you're so vulnerable in public with your healing, but you know, I'm, you know, a lot like when I write about sobriety, you know, I don't drink anymore. Like, right. I, and I, when I was actively in my addiction of alcoholism, I was writing publicly. So I don't know, maybe I have a, you know, a, you know, not in front of so many people, but I was writing like a monthly column on this underground Grand Rapids punk website, you know, and was trashed. And so, yeah, I've always just, um, I don't think it's for everyone, but it, for the most part has always felt really comfortable to me. And, um, I, yeah, I think I've really learned to like separate myself from people's projections and 
overly asking me for things or boundary stuff. Like I just hold my boundaries and, but yeah, there's, I'm always a couple. And actually, here we go. Here's something I identify because I'm so public with my healing. Sometimes when I'm really working on something like in therapy or with my fellows, like I get, I, I have, it's not imposter syndrome, but I'm like, am I a fraud for talking about how healed this part of me is when this other part of me is like still very in process behind the scenes. And I think that's something I'm like always kind of working on is like, I hope I'm committed to healing forever. So you don't see all of it though, you know? So what do you think about healing in public? I don't do it. <laughs> I know you don't. I'm, <laughs> I'm a very private person and I value that because like for me, I'm like, I think some people, um, I think for some people, the, the bringing it out and the share is their, it's, it is the, is part of the healing. It's totally. part of the healing. I don't, I mean, I think that I share like this much, you know, um, And I don't really know why, I I mean, I can I say something really weird that just popped into my head? Of course. I just think like my own healing is boring. Like it's like, I don't, what I have to heal is, I'm sure many people can relate, but like, I don't, it's like, I don't wanna read my old journals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't wanna, you know, I don't know. So I don't, I don't, I don't heal in public. I, I share, I will share once in a while, very similar to you, Marley, when I have, when I've come on something that has helped me mm -hmm. and I'm, all this has given me support. So I'm going to share it. Um, but like when I'm in process, like I know about it, my therapist knows about it. One or two other people know about it, but I'm not, I personally am not interested in that. And I think it's fine. I think that's totally fine, you know, to be private about some things. Um, and I think it's beautiful, Marley, like your vulnerability is very, is very beautiful to me. Um, I admire that very much uh, about you because I think often we're drawn to people who are, you know, different. Um, but yeah, my healing is my business. Amen. Um, let's see. Um, oh, this is a good one. Ah, oh, they're just so good. They're really good. Um, woo! <laughs> I wish we could. We should, I wish we could just do a podcast like this. This would be so fun. Okay. Yeah. So you're both such collaborative artists, writers, makers. Can you talk about how you've clicked and found the people you want to make beautiful things with? Collective work is amazing, but also challenging. So just curious how you find your people. Thank you for all your work. And thank you for introducing me to so many other incredible artists, writers, and witches. That's sweet. Well, um, you know, I read this in a zine many years ago. That was, um, this person said something like, if you're at a zine fest, Find, like find the most intimidating person in the room and see if they'll be friends with you. And so when I was, anytime I've run an artist residency and people apply to it, I oftentimes pick the most intimidating, coolest people and then somehow convince them to be my friends. And that's what I did with Sarah. I was like, oh my God, she's so cool. I love her art. And so I was like, do you want to come live in my house for 10 days? And she was like, yep. And I was like, okay. Um, and that's, I mean, tell them that actual story. <laughs> what? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember it all. Okay. <laughs> I remember it all. And, uh, okay. Just, I didn't know. I don't know what you remember and you don't. We were, we remember things the same. Um, we, we hit it off. Um, I think we hit it off just because we both like to laugh and both like to be silly. Right? Yeah. We had a lot of fun and will, and we found our will. 
mean, I already knew Will, but um, and yeah, I mean, I will, I will say that I personally don't do a lot of collaborative work with people specifically. I do a lot of facilitating and invite people into containers that I have made. Um, that has worked for me. Um, the few times I have. Uh, um, when I when I'm doing like dance and movement work with musicians, that's a space I collaborate in more. But um, yeah, I think just like you know, I don't think reach out to like the coolest person you know with no context and be like, do you want to be my friend? You might they might think that's weird, but like you know, I think you know, read the room, see the vibe. Like, do you feel like there's crossover of what you're interested in and committed to and see if they want to hang out or work on something together. And, you know, I've also had people say no to me and I have had to learn to not take that personally and to just be like, you know, they're not available and they're not my people. And when I stew on that, it takes up a lot of space. So I try not to, because usually there's like, my people are ready for me somewhere else and somewhere else. So. I love that so much. Um, everything to what you said. I'm interested in so many different things and so many different people that like for me, I love, I love making more space in very similar to you, Marley, like in boundary ways or in like clearer ways. Like you I know have your, your art residencies, which are clear, like you're like, okay, you're going to come here and this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to promote and I'm going to share. And also maybe we won't become best friends or, you know, whatever, whatever that is. Um, I think it's really important to have clear boundaries for me. I just, the main way that I bring folks in is um, for me, the two ways, I guess, are the many moons project where I always have like a ton of uh, collaborate. They're not collaborators. I um, pay people to contribute people that I admire and respect. Um, and that's really the only thing I don't really collaborate with people. I like to keep friends, my friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't always collaborate with them. And I think that like, it's really important in any kind of collaboration to have really, uh, clear expectations, mm -hmm. clear boundaries and contracts whenever necessary. And that's all I will say about that. So well, actually, I just want to say, I was thinking before we did this, five years of very like consistent friendship. I think this is the first public event we've ever done together. Other than when you were a resident and I, and you taught in the store, right? But even then, like we weren't, I mean, you were supporting me, but you right. know, yeah. But I that's an interesting thing like we have really protected our friendship that, that is actually even though we talk about our work so much to each other we have really kept our friendship very separate from work and i think that just depends on the person yeah. you know like i i i just for me again like uh yeah i had a collaboration that was not a collaboration so i'm a little bit uh I'm tender. That's the word that we use. Okay. Okay. I'm really curious how you all are approaching creativity and creating in the midst of these pandemic times. Do you still have expectations about what you are making? How do you make space to rest and restore? How have you had to adjust and be flexible in the midst of these uncertain times? <laughs> uh ooh, I you know in this moment I really feel like my work and creative practice this year has actually come more into alignment than it ever has before and that's not true for everybody, but there's been a, I just, I've had a lot of solitude this year, um, both from, so my partner and I moved to a, a small town in New Mexico for, uh, Jackie is a wildland firefighter. And so she was gone really most of the time for many months in a row. And so, um, 
usually that's even harder for me, but I think it really pushed me to like get a sewing studio outside my house. I have like a home office here. I got an assistant named Isabel. Shout out to Isabel Osgood Roach. Um, you should all follow her on Instagram. She's worn underscore underscore wear. Um, and yeah, I don't even want to call her an assistant. Like she's really like it. She is my collaborator. Like she has co-visioned my business and my offerings with me. And um, so what I'll say is that's why I started teaching my quilting class and why I offer the things I do, because I have been able to access a lot of creative and business flow this year. And it's that's where it's been really beautiful. It's like most people who take my quilting class kind of sign up thinking they won't actually be able to figure it out, which is amazing to me. And then they, after the first day, they're like, I'm going to make a fucking quilt. And I'm like, yeah, you fucking are. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like, I have just really seen how impactful my practice has been to, uh, and teaching. One of my dance mentors said this recently, like, teaching keeps me in my practice. And so me teaching my quilting classes has me quilting more. Like when I teach dance classes, I dance more. Um, so I'm trying to remember that. Like I really love to teach. I really, I used to feel like online teaching was like weird or cheesy. And now I like, I just love it. Um, and the pandemic has, you know, that's where it's been tricky. That's where it's been good for that. And that's what's been keeping me generous is I'm like, wow, I have the ability to sell out these Zoom classes that feed my practice, empower these other people, and I'm financially comfortable. So where can I give that to people who are not able to access that same comfort right now? Um, yeah, my creativity has not struggled in the pandemic. A lot of other parts of my mental health have, but um, my art seems to be flowing right now. That's awesome. I just want to like counter that for anyone who's listening. Like um, my creativity has been non-existent. Um, for me, it's been like all that I can do to try to get through the, like, how do I say it? I had a very difficult process with my book and the publishers. I had a very, 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 very difficult process that, um, really derailed a lot of my year, which is ridiculous to say because of how derailed, how many millions of people have been. So I'm not trying to like, I'm just talking about myself though. So that took a lot up a lot of my time. And honestly, just trying to like support my partner. My partner is an ICU nurse who was caring for COVID patients. Um, from the end of April to June and he was quarantining in our house and just kind of like that and just trying to run my business, just trying to keep my business afloat um, was where all my energy went. So I was, have, I am not, I have not, I am not creative at all. I haven't created like anything that felt like really great. Um, I don't, I haven't been in like flow. I've been in no, no flow, no flow 2020. So I just want to honor that because I think that not every year is like, I hate all of those things like King Lear was written and with Shakespeare. And there is going to be some really great art that comes out of this. There have been some great albums. Taylor Swift's record is a masterpiece, like, you know, many others, but I have had no creative, um, breakthroughs or inklings and I have not I have certainly felt bad about it like I have certainly judged myself I've been like you have the most time you've ever had because you're in your home quarantining but like you're you know again you can't even like put your laundry away what's going on um but that's okay like it's like honestly I'm like as long as I'm alive and like my partner is alive like to me that is the utmost thing so i did a, things this year but they weren't like me tapping into my flow and if the other thing and then i'll shut up but for a lot of creatives i think myself included i know some creatives who can create under any condition mm -hmm. like, and these are the people that are thriving right now you know my creativity and my mental health are are they they chill 
So if I'm just trying to get my mental health to be like, like not at the bottom of the well, but like hanging out halfway, like, and that's where I'm at. And I, you know, that, that's what's going on. That's just what's going on in the words of Natalie and Bruglia. So I don't want anyone to be like, oh my God, I didn't write my novel. Or I mean, it, last but not least, creatives are sensitive. Yeah. We are sensitive to what is going on in the world. So if you're like overloaded um, or if you're like, if that is really impacting you and impacting your creativity, um, you're not alone, you know? And well, I also, great. I'm so glad you found your flow. Like I am also, and also I'm so like, oh, that's so great. Great. And I, yeah. And I'm like, I think the other thing I'm thinking about though, is like someone said earlier, something like self-improvement. Oh, constant improvement is a coping strategy. It's like, yeah, just because my creative flow is good doesn't mean I'm feeling any of my feelings or dealing with any of my internal shit. Like I can make a lot of quilts and not feel anything, you know? So I think that's where it's like, well, I'm just saying like I side of the quilting industry. They're all like, must make more quilts. I must sell more beautiful quilts. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that because I think that's the other thing, right? As we see everyone's projections of themselves on social media in their creative flow we have no idea what the rest of their life looks like so and like not to be hella cheese but like sometimes we need the moments of quiet like or we need the moments of feeling frustrated or blocked or not being creative to just get our laundry folded and like organize our house you know so okay, okay. what this one's so good what do you do with your white shame? Mm. The pain that comes from working down into your whiteness and just seeing and diving into all the layers of trauma and complicity and history. So do you want me to start? You, I'll have you start this one, but I, I got some. I know. I hear all the, <laughs> the big question. I'll say it again from Sarah, but go ahead. So the first thing I'm going to say, and I say this like any time I talk about whiteness publicly, is I would really love for those of you who feel called to enter your thoughts in the chat, because I am just one white person, you know, and like my white experience is different than your white experience. My investigations are different. My thoughts are different. So I know that whenever we are gathered together, there are literally like 143, obviously not everyone on the chat is white, but there's 143 people on here. So like, I know there are other people who have ideas and thoughts. And I, I have found that like the chats are, can be really generative, especially like folks will give like reading uh, suggestions or podcast suggestions that are really, really great. So that's the first, I wanna open the floor to anyone who feels called to like share. That's the first thing I wanna say. Um, the second thing I, or well, I'll just, I'm not gonna bullet point it. I'm just gonna talk through. I don't, um, I don't really have shame. Shame isn't really the right word. I am disturbed, I am disgusted. Um, I uh, have a lot of grief, I have a lot of, anger maybe that's some shame guilt for sure the guilt maybe guilt is mine like white guilt mm -hmm. um it's a very weird thing to grapple with an identity that has been put upon you in order to abuse and um steal and commit unspeakable acts of horror and violence to other people. Like that is just, that's bigger, I think, than any one person to sort of try to, to process, you know, and also like going into the whole, like my identity is a lie thing is like whiteness is a lie, right? Like, that's not, it's a construct that was invented to subject other people, to abuse other people. 
um, to give us certain rights, privileges, comforts. I think that's the really just, I mean, there's so many layers of disturbingness to all of it, but it's like to give us comfort, there's unspeakable tragedy and suffering and trauma and pain and violence and theft and erasure. Um, that is a lot. And also I think we all have to be like aware of it. And I think that we have to educate ourselves um, with it. And I think that as we all know, how we like, I was speaking about deprogramming like a minute ago, that's gonna look really different per person. You know, I have some friends who are very connected to their ancestry who are white. Like they're very connected to their Polish ancestry or they're very connected to their um, French ancestry or, you know, whatever that is. Um, my ancestry is Jewish. Uh, it's all from the same place in Eastern Europe. It's Slavic and Russian and German and Austrian. Like that's it. And I don't and I and I don't have that strong of a connection because of assimilation. So part of my personal work is to create that connection, whether that be through um, talking to my family, research, recipes, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, uh, Polish folklore, Slavic folklore, mythology, um, all of that. Like that's that's for that's for me, uh, that's for me to do. But I think that on the other, that's like my personal work to have me feel connected to some aspect of mine that was erased or taken away from. But then there's the other piece of like the whole white feelings thing, right? Because that's sort of what came up when you're like the white shame and the pain and the, you know, all of the, the horror. Um, and so to me, that's two part. That's like deprogramming from that, like deprogramming from aspects of my whiteness, like entitlement, urgency, saviorism, complicity, comfort, helplessness. I mean, it's a bouquet, right? It's all, it's an array of variation per, and it goes from person to person. See where that shows up for me. And then like do fucking something. Like do something to divest from whiteness. Do many things to divest from whiteness. And there is no end. And we've been so lucky to have so many brilliant minds talking about this since the days of slavery. You know, literally since there was slavery, there were people who were abolitionists up into the present day. So, um, you know, there are ways to do that and to, become more and more comfortable divesting from whiteness, like psychologically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, and like with our actions, you know, and luckily there's no end to the work. So it's not like, what do I do? It's like, it's, there's so much that can be done. Um, those are, that's just some, some thoughts for me. I know this was really long. I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Um, yeah, I just, I don't have much to add. Maybe we'll, um, like concrete, like more tangible tools that I have participated in or used. Um, I think that something that was really transformative for me was taking an eight week course with other white people um, that was facilitated by this group in the Bay Area called Stronghold. Uh, highly recommend looking them up. And, you know, I also just listen to like the black queers and femmes in my community and sort of what they're asking. So that was like a close, um, Sarah just disappeared in my circle, but um, I'm going to keep talking. I think I'm, I think I'm still okay. there. No, you're I'm, still there. I'm here. Okay. Oh, you're there. Okay, great. Everybody's here. Um, it's probably my rural Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, like one of my, you know, a, a close friend was sort of like, I think, you know, who is black and who's queer was like, I kind of think you should think about taking this. And I was like, great, thank you so much. And, you know, so, because that's the other thing, Sarah mentioned, like, we're not a monolith and neither are the people in our lives who are calling for things. So like, you know, someone mentioned white fragility in the chat. There's a lot of people who think 
that book is really fucked up that it's written by a white woman. And there's a lot of people, including black people in my life who've been like, please read this book. So again, it's like, to me, it's like paying attention to just like, what is my community asking of me? What are people close to me asking of me? Um, I want to shout out to podcast episodes to listen to, and then I will stop talking. But um, to me, like the shame goes away when I just stay active in my practice of being anti-racist. Um, I, I, I get out of my own shit and I'm just like, I'm a vessel here to like figure this out and understand it. Um, and Brene Brown uh, interviews Austin Channing Brown, who's a um, black woman and author and something they talk a lot about in that conversation is like, there's not a rule book. So you can't figure out how to do yeah. this right. And that was so impactful to me. It was like, don't try to memorize the rules so that you don't mess up. Like that is white supremacy. Like you're going to mess up. Yeah. You're not perfect. Um, and then, yeah, a book that really changed my life was My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menicum. And he is also on an episode of On Being uh, with Krista Tippett. She also has an episode with him and Robin D'Angelo, which is also really interesting to hear their dynamic. Um, but yeah, I mean, just listen to, to the thought leaders that are paving the way. And I think really being... Like I'm about to take like a follow up session with Stronghold. So that's like, to me, I like became a part of a community yeah. that I feel like is other white people who are continuously active in that. And then um, I'm also a part of Rachel Cargill's great, the great unlearning her Patreon and definitely consider her um, a teacher to me. And she's an amazing writer. And that's an amazing, another amazing offering that, that she has. But I think just really like, the shame kind of goes away when you just really start to like Sarah said, kind of like interrogate that stuff and be active in like being anti-racist. I, I love all of that. I wanted to add one book I'm reading right now. I'm sure. And I'm sure it's available at Charis, which is um, cast. Are you guys selling that Charis books? Yes. Yes, definitely. Great. So that is a great book. I have only, I'm only like three chapters in, but it's so great. Um, but I, I just want to say one thing on top, like the inner work is never going to be ending with the white, with the whiteness. Um, but we have to do something. So there's never going to be this point where it's like, I've unpacked all my shame or I've unpacked, you know, like there's many layers to this. Um, and I think that, I want to ask my fellow white folks to be like, what am I doing? Like what conversations am I having? Who am I? Am I volunteering for Raphael Warnock's like campaign to flip the Senate? Like, am I having uncomfortable conversations with certain family members? Am, am I, um, you know, what, what am I, what am I doing? What uncomfortable conversations am I having at my job? If I have a job, um, what am I, what am I doing, you know, enough so that like, I'm uncomfortable or that I'm like, I'm like moving things forward because I think that like, uh, people can confuse like both the inner work for like, you you have all of the, these feelings for like doing work because it's so emotionally exhausting, which it is. Um, and it gets a lot easier once you are sort of like in, in a kind of practice, uh, with it. So I just want to urge, like, pick a thing that you do, schedule it in. Uh, there's lots of, like, the group I join is um, White People for Black Lives. Like, so it's like the adjacent group to Black Lives Matter in LA. There's many of these groups everywhere. Like Marley said, I'm interested in taking that class. Like, but like, do, like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing um, over and over and over again? Um, yeah. I don't think we'll have time for our last two questions, but I just want to like do a self promotion dance and be like those two questions and anything else are answered in me and Sarah's books. And if you're like, I can't afford a book right now, Sarah and I both provide extensive writing and free resources in our newsletters, which are free to subscribe to. And you can listen to my radio show every Sunday. You can call in and ask your advice questions. We have 
a lot of different things to offer into the world. Um, yeah, I have a podcast too. Yes, and Sarah started her moonbeaming podcast. So yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot. There's there's a lot. lot of and the other thing I want to say, <laughs> I'm all like, and then if you can't afford a book, that's fine. Um, but you can order our books for your library. Yes, you can. Or order my book from Charis Books, please. <laughs> yes. Oh, look at all these great, nice resources in the chat. Right. Thank you. Sarah, thank you, thank you so me. much for being here with me. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. These, this was great. Yeah, what a great session. Yeah, y'all, um, thank you so much. This was lovely. Um, it's always nice to get to you know, be a, be a fly on the wall when friends who are smart talk to each other about smart things. Um, so thank you. And thanks to everybody watching at home. We really appreciate all of your thoughtful questions, um, your deep work, you know, it's, it's great also to like be, it feels like we're in a big virtual room of folks who are, who are working on themselves. Right. And like, there's something really great about that, that even though we're far apart, you can kind of feel that intention behind this gathering. Um, so I'm really, really glad for that. Uh, somebody mentioned emergent strategy and Adrian Marie Brown in the chat. And I do want to let folks know we have a YouTube channel where I'll be repackaging this and adding captions and putting this video up there. But we also have a great video from two weeks ago with Adrian Marie Brown and Alexis Pauline Gums, um, about the wisdom of Marine, the black feminist wisdom of Marine, um, mammals. So uh, you, it, I feel like folks who are on this would dig that. So definitely go check that out. Um, very much about, um, the wisdom of, you know, just like the next right thing and the next right thing also. So wow. please check that out. Check out yeah, our, our YouTube channel. Oh my goodness. So wow. cute, Sasha, uh, our YouTube channel is just, um, backslash Kara circle. So go check that out. I do want folks to know that you can email us at info at Karis Books and more um, to buy Marley's book because we have copies ready to ship. If you're in Atlanta, you can pick them up on our front porch tomorrow. Um, and you can also give us a call at the store um, between um, 12 and 6 p.m. any day of the week and we will package it up and hand it to you. But we do ship anywhere in the um, continental US, actually in the entire US. Um, and we're happy to get it out to you right away. I dropped the link to Sarah's book in the chat. So that is not yet out of stock. So we can, you can go ahead and pre-order that. It comes out officially December 15th now, is that correct? Okay. Allegedly. Allegedly. Well, we will ship it the second it hits the ground. I'll tell you that. So um, it's available. You can you can click on it. Um, How to not always be working is available as well. So we can we can ship all of those out. Um, the last thing it is my sort of job and pleasure to do is um, to ask for support for our work. So Karis is a nonprofit. Um, and we do all of our work uh, primarily as individually donor sponsored. So we know you know people's money is all over the place right now. Um, but one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars really helps us do this work. It helps us pay for this platform. Um, and really helps us kind of pay it forward um, in, in lots of the ways that we talked about tonight. So the last thing I'll say is we do have a parenting group for um, people who have kids in their lives that are trying to dismantle white supremacy from within the family structure. So you don't have to be a biological parent. Um, if you're just like a teacher, if you're somebody who's considering having children and you want to really sit with that um, before you bring white children into the world um, or before you consider transracial adoption. Um, we definitely encourage folks to come be a part of that group and that's a monthly group. Um, we also can help you plug into other resources in Atlanta and in, in the South that are working on dismantling white supremacy. So particularly um, there are lots of great multiracial groups, but specifically if you're a white person who's looking for resources, um, hit us up. Uh, you can hit us up again at that info at karisbooksandmore.com email and we'll we'll try and get you connected and plugged in because we really believe that so we have this opportunity right now where we can be connecting with one another virtually and um, in some ways these resources are more accessible virtually so um, you don't have to 
you know, take a whole weekend off of work and go sit in a room and, you know, be, be on. It's like, you actually can do these things in a, in a little bit of a different way. And um, that's a real opportunity for folks who are just beginning this journey. So we hope folks will take advantage of it. Um, so thank you both for a wonderful evening. I hope you both stay safe and healthy um, and continue to just, um, you know, enjoy what is enjoyable about this process of putting your work into the world and uh, let the rest go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ER. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Paris Books. And thank you to everyone who came. This was really special. A great way to end the day. Yes. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone.